So once he kind of lays this out, he then um, wants then to give us a kind of history. I mean, he wants to, he want, he, he lays out a kind of these three stages of language um, in which you've got the earlier languages, sort of the, the middle languages, and the, and, the, and the sort of the final languages, right? Um, and he starts out actually with his warrant, um, which, where he says in this section on page 16, another way of comparing languages and determining their relative antiquity is to consider their script, you know, the way they're written, and reason inversely from the degree of perfection of this art. The cruder the writing, the more ancient the language, right? So this is his warrant. This is how he's going to say, well, we, if we're going to look at these different existing languages, um, we can look at their writing systems in order to determine which ones are, are older, right? Um, and so that's, that's his warrant, is that we can do this. And then the claim is that the primitive way of writing was not to represent sounds, but objects themselves. So this is the, the kind of the, the, the first, I suppose, claim uh, about um, how different languages in the present relate to each other. And so then he has his evidence where he, where he says, um, uh, whether directly as with the Mexicans or by allegorical imagery as the Egyptians did. Um, the translation, unfortunately, is, um, is not, it's not very accurate at this point. So I've changed the translation here on the slide. I kind of crossed out some words and, um, in order to actually reflect more correctly what the, what the French says. Yes. Does anybody else speak French here? A little bit? Well, you, if, you, if you look at the French, you can see it's very clear that he's, he's saying that, the, that um, as with the Mexicans, um, so directly as with the Mexicans or allegorical, uh, by allegorical imagery as with the Egyptians, right? So he's doing this, this parallel. He's, he's not, I don't know, the, 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 the English translation is a strange one. That they, I don't know why they did that. Okay, in any case, um, the examples are Mexican and uh, so, 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 you know, the, the kind of Mexican hieroglyphics, you know, and then, uh, and then the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And he's saying both of those um, represent not um, sounds, but objects themselves. And that's the sort of earliest stage of language, right? And it corresponds to a passionate language um, that uh, all, all it presupposes some kind of society, but a kind of, you know, a primitive society in which the passions are, and, and the needs are sort of linked together and there's, you know, there's, there's yeah, it's, he sees that as, as a simpler way of doing things, of having these, these signs refer to objects, right? Um, and so that's the first stage of language. Uh, then he goes to the second stage of language and he says, the second way um, is to represent words and propositions by conventional characters. So instead of having a sign refer to an object, um, he says that the signs now um, represent um, words and propositions, right? And in fact, he says actually they, they represent sounds. So he, you know, his evidence is here, um, Chinese, such as the writing of the Chinese, it truly represents sounds and speaks to the eyes, right? So he, here he's seeing a kind of more advanced kind of language because it's not, no longer representing objects but now representing sounds. So there's a relationship between the, the words and the sound. Um, and he says, um, and, there, there's, and the reasoning here for why this would indicate a kind of more advanced form is he says that this can only be done when the language is completely formed and entire people is united by common laws, for this already presupposes a twofold convention. So he's saying that um, in order for the, uh, for the signs of a language to refer to um, sounds, uh, there need to be conventions. There need to be sort of agreements about what different things mean, and that um, is also um, what you need in order to have um, laws and sort of more uh, complex forms of society requires this, these types of conventions. And so he sees a kind of development also moving um, in language and in society at the same time, right? Um, so that's his second stage of language, right? And then he says the third stage of language is, of course, French, right? <laughs> uh, that's where you get to at the end um, because um, in this kind of language, um, his claim is that the th th in the third stage, um, um, you don't just represent speech like Chinese would. You're not just, the, the signs don't refer to words, but actually they analyze speech, right? And so that's what's, you know, that's, that's where you get to when you get to an alphabet, because he says that in order to create an alphabet, and um, 
this is the, the reasoning up there, right? See, so the third is to break down the speaking voice into a given number of elementary particles, either vocal or articulate, with which one can form all the words and syllables imaginable. So he's saying that um, in order to, to, to come up with an alphabet, you have to break down the sounds of language into these component pieces um, and then you know, assign these, these words and syllables to these different pieces. And then the evidence then is th these commercial peoples, right? So now, ra rather than referring to a kind of um, society with laws, he's talking about sort of these merchants that travel all around speaking different languages and then analyzing the different languages and figuring out characters that would be common to all of them and that could refer to the different sounds, right? Um, and so, um, again, through all of this, right, his warrant has been that we can compare the development of languages by looking at their writing, right? And that's kind of the key way he's, he's thinking this through, right? Um, sure, what's, what's your question? What's your name? Okay, yes, uh, sorry. Right, okay. Um, so that's the third stage of language. And then overall then, um, so you know, he has these three paragraphs outlined in the three stages of language, and then he has this final paragraph that kind of brings it all together and gives us an overarching claim. And the overarching claim of the whole section is that these three ways of writing correspond almost exactly to three different stages according to, when, according to which one can, s can consider men gathered into a nation. Right? So these are the three stages of, of writing correspond then to three stages of civilization. Right? So he says then, the reason is the depicting of object is appropriate to a savage people, signs of words and of propositions to a barbaric people, and the alphabet to civilized peoples. Um, and um, the evidence then is, so you know, he, he's laid it out pretty, pretty neatly here in the sense that that overall claim has these reasons <coughs> and the evidence for those reasons is in the preceding three paragraphs where he, he outlined, you know, he gave us more detail about each of those stages, right? Um, so, it, you know, it's, he, he gives us a nice structure for us and you can use that, um, you know, if you want in your, in your summaries of argument, but it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's, it's very neat, right? Um, except that, um, you know, the, the way, you know, the way he does it is it depends upon this warrant, right? where we're not really sure is it you know does it make sense to think about different languages in the present um, kind of um, you know representing different stages of language development it's it's not really clear I mean he, he gives us that warrant uh, and he and he buttresses it with this notion of how different societies you know need different languages but it's not clear um, that, that 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 it really matches up so we're going we're to talk about that in a second